Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Shot, episode 328, featuring part two of an interview with Mr. Rob Irving. This part of the interview, we talk about Strike Commander, Pacific Strike, and what he thinks about uh, working with Chris Roberts, and also his thoughts on why game designers need skills in graphics and programming. A lot of great stuff in this episode, so without further ado, here is Mr. Rob Irving back up a little bit okay so you got all these maps and campaign notes i guess and character sheets or whatever and a war inspector's not impressed not impressed enough apparently it's surprisingly um and this was like i was just in my last semester of college i guess my my i had two summer sessions left i guess and so i it was it was like six months before i was going to finish and i was dreading the phone call to my parents i'm like okay so i'm going to drop out of college and go work at origin and make video games because I had no idea what I was going to do when I got out of college. I was panicked when I didn't get the job because, you know, I, I'm getting to the end of my college career and I have no idea what I'm going to do with my life. I'm like, I have an English degree. And they didn't even, have, they didn't even have Starbucks at that time, right? So <laughs> what does an English major do? I don't. Yeah. And I really, I was, I was kind of at a loss and I got a call the day of my last exam. I got a call from Chris Roberts. He had seen my stuff, and he was apparently more impressed than Warren was, and he said, hey, you want to come work on Strike Commander? I'm like, I have no idea what that is, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> so, it, it, it's a job. And I think I started at, what, 14000 a year? It was, it was, you know, basically the same as working in the computer lab in college. <laughs> I'm trying to adjust for inflation for that. I mean, yeah. that's still not... <laughs> What? Poverty line, but it didn't matter. I was making video games. Yes, I was going to work ninety hours a week, and I was making video games. It didn't matter. Did you point. have a family to support or anything to, to worry about? No, along those I, lines. Nothing to worry about except a pickup truck, you know. So it was it was pretty easy. Um, I could I could stretch that and make me do because I mean I was living a college life before that. It's not like you're you're living large in college for the most part, and I certainly wasn't. Well, sometimes so. you get those deluxe ramen noodles, you know, when you have a, <laughs> you want to treat yourself. I'm gonna buy a whole crate of ramen now, <laughs> but yeah, that's it, it. Was it went from I have no idea what I'm gonna do with my life to well, this is obviously what I should be doing with my life, mm -hmm. and you know that, what was it? I mean, so Chris, I guess he saw something that Warren didn't see, and then that, that what? I don't know. I, I really never figured out exactly. How did he get the strike command? I mean, there's there's a big question mark here in my mind. I don't. I'm it's trying like, to numbers he liked he liked the fact that i did stats and stuff i think that's what he was thinking when he brought me on it because i mean at the time we were tda as technical design assistance was the title officially um which basically meant you know do all the grunt work that the programmers don't want to do um and so i guess he saw that i had a lot of detail in this, in my in my campaigns and a lot of you know a lot of stats and, and a lot of, of order and he thought well that's what we need right now is a bunch of numbers in our game so that's i guess that's where it came from but i never, never ever found out how it went from sitting on warren's desk to sitting on chris's desk and chris decided yeah we'll bring this guy in now i did have a friend from college who was working there too and he might have had some influence but he wasn't on that game he was actually working on Arthurian Legends. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I just happenstance, I guess, that Chris ended up seeing me. Damn it. You take him out or I will. Back off. I've almost got tone. Nice kill, hot shot. Well, you gonna finish him off? Forget it. The sector is clear. But what about the price on his head? I'm a fighter pilot, Tex. Not a murderer. Returning to base. But it worked out, and, you know, it, it was a good fit. It turned out to be that it was a lot of number crunching. And then we eventually got into all the level building and everything. But for the most part, I was organizing all the story flow and everything for, for Strike Commander. So mm -hmm. it, it fit well. So you just settled right into the job? Or was there a period of, oh, my God, how did I get here? What's... I, like, on my third day, I got in trouble with my boss, um, Mike Sims, genius. He, um, 
he explained to me that there, there are a lot of clown shoes as far as egos, and it's easy to step on to, toes in the game industry. Because I got uh, one of our writers had sent in some dialogue, and I couldn't help it. I have a red pen that's just naturally in my head. So oh, I no. I a bunch of it and sent it back. And so Mike immediately calls me into his office. He's like, don't, don't do that. <laughs> you need to be a little more diplomatic. This is not the way to start out. <laughs> so, yeah. It, Settled right in, maybe not, but you know, we had this like really dark, cold office. My first of like 16 offices at Origin, and it was uh, just the, t the TDAs in the design pit. And yeah, we were we were crunching numbers and building maps. And TDAs, was, I mean, that, that doesn't sound very sexy. A technical that, design assistant, that... yeah, <laughs> yeah, not not even a little bit sexy. I mean, it really was. Only things the programmers didn't want to do because they were really still the designers of the game. And of course, this was a Chris Roberts game. You know, he is the visionary behind it. You know, he's he's going to be driving that. So yeah, people like stand up like... when he comes into the room. I mean, what? what... <laughs> <laughs> I won't tell him you said that. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, there is certainly a. He's got. A, he's definitely got a, a presence to him. He's he, and he he can be very. Uh, critical but you know at the same time he, he is he, he's so driven he works so hard it's not like he's asking you to do something he won't mm -hmm. because he'll do anything in a game I mean if he doesn't like it he'll just go in and fix it <laughs> that's it, it's good to work for a boss who is that passionate about it too mm -hmm. but you know I mean it's also difficult because you want to be the creative guy too and it's you know there's not not always room for more than one creative guy so you, you learn to be a, a diplomat very quickly but yeah, we invented the position of designer, of game designer. We invented that whole track at Origin. Um, all of us TDAs sat down and were like, we need a department. Quit calling me TDA. Exactly. Oh. I think I'm better than that. What, what are my career opportunities? Do I have to become a programmer to succeed here? And so, yeah, we sat down and we talked it over and we worked up a, a whole job structure for our design department and everything. And like a manifesto? or Yeah, it was. <laughs> Did this go over well? Was there pushback from... HR thought it was great. It's like we we want to have our own progression. That's that's what we were thinking is this shouldn't be just a stepping stone to becoming a programmer because we think design is as important as programming in the games. And the artists have a track and the programmers have a track. Why doesn't design? So, no, the, the actually that went over very well. HR thought that we needed that structure. So, you know, it uh it certainly helped us out because we felt like we could go somewhere in our in our preferred field. As opposed to having to bolt from it to, to get more money or to you know to advance in in the industry, so it was uh, it was good to become not a TDA. You know, it's, it's interesting to, to, to what you just said there because I was uh, thinking about something else you had mentioned in that interview. I think this was the one with Adam, uh, where you're talking about the Descendant Studios, and you said one one of the things you liked about this was everybody's a programmer and everybody's a designer. And, it almost yep. sounded like you feel like people should know something about programming to be, to be a, a good designer. I mean, was am I, am I putting words into your mouth, or would you? Uh... Not at all. No, no. Actually, you're, you're absolutely dead on with that. I, I, when I interview designers, it does help a lot. I mean, what know... level of programming skills are we talking about here? It depends. I mean, you have designers who have different specializations. I mean, I don't necessarily need a map builder to be a programmer. If you are really good at map building, and you know, you, you bring in your D and D campaign or your little you know, the little level you built for some game just as a mod, um, that's fine. I, th that is one specialization that I certainly also need. But it does help if you're really going to be successful as a designer or a producer even to know a little bit about all the, the different aspects of game development. Oh, hurry up, man. Boss is coming in. Dude, I almost got it. Hey, guys. Finished testing that game yet? I've got another one I need designed. We just finished level three and need to tighten up the graphics a little bit. Great. Hey, I can't believe we got jobs doing this. I know. And my mom said I would never get anywhere with these games. So I certainly prefer to hire somebody who either has a background in art or a background in programming so that they are already able to interface with the other teams better. Because, I mean, a lot of there are programmers out there who will look down their noses at you if you don't understand what they do. And, you know, it's... Since I spent some time in management as well, I learned very quickly that you have to really earn the respect of those programmers. And to do that, it helps if you know what they're talking about. So. What's an example of uh, 
say some designer doesn't know crap about programming. <laughs> I mean, what what is the problem? What are they what are they what are they screwing up on? Well, I mean, nowadays, especially with the the engines that are out there, if you have a little programming, you can almost build an entire game yourself as a designer without any programmer help. Um, if you know some scripting languages, at least, which is you know, it's halfway programming. It's not necessarily full blown, but understanding the logic and all of that helps you design things that are practical. I mean, if you you come up with this grandiose system that can't possibly be implemented, well, how would you know that mm -hmm. without some background in it? But I mean, even if you just pick up that much knowledge over the course of a job, it's like if you understand how long things take then your designs will be better. So you don't have to be a programmer, but it does help. That's a good quotation there. That's, well, I mean, that, that's, that punchy. That, that's punchy. That's punchy. It's punchy. <laughs> huh. That, that, the, the, the other Rob quote that goes on in any, uh, when any kid comes up to me and says, how do you do become a game designer? I'm like, read everything. I don't care what it is. Read everything. Because it doesn't hurt to be a writer either. <laughs> that's an English major coming out on you there. Well, yeah, okay, maybe there's a little bias there, but I mean, the more Have you, you know about... Have you ever read Wuthering Heights? <laughs> I've read Wuthering Heights twice. It wasn't half the other time. Way to choose your own adventure out of it, you know? Oh, yeah, but that's, I mean, they, they, everything borrows from everything in, in design, and I don't care what you're designing. Writers borrow from other writers, or steal, whatever you want to call it, you know, but game, game development, you can borrow ideas from anywhere. Whatever strikes your fancy, you know, it's you've probably seen something out there that's influencing what you're building right now, whether you remember it or not. So, um, yeah, I mean, read everything and sure, learn to program or learn art. Either one. Be be uh, somebody who can contribute in both teams, you know, because at that point, A, you're going to work better with the other team. But B, it also means that you are more self-sufficient. So that means I can send you off to build a map and you can build the map and the artwork to go in it. So that's great. <laughs> Well, let's let's go back to the Strike Commander game. Strike Commander. <sighs> so I don't know if you had, did. You imagine you'd be working on something like this when you got that call? I I really didn't know anything about what I was getting myself into. Um, I mean, this I, game sounds kind of ahead of its time, too, politically speaking. You know, with, with yeah, the jihad well, and everything. It sounds like it was made today, really. The yeah, well, in, in true three D, that was that was just starting in games. I mean, if you think about it. Even Doom wasn't really fully 3D. It was two and a half, they call oh, it. But... Well, John Romero didn't hear <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he knows. But, yeah, I mean, it was a plain game. Okay, not necessarily the first thing I would think about. But, um, yeah, it was, gotta... it was just, no, light off, light off, light off. Oh, light I'm in an interview. <laughs> so, well, Eric in Peterson there. is now inserting himself into the interview. No, he's, he's the comic relief at our office. This is how our old days go usually. So you know, this is this is not unusual at all. Um, you gotta have a little fun. I mean, what would, what would be the point of being in this industry if you're all buttoned down? And... That is true. Yes, we are definitely a silly industry, and I mean, it, it's it's going to be hard work a lot of times. But that's the fact that that most teams really do have a, a lot of fun too. It kind of eases that a little bit. Um, you know, every every game development place I've worked at has got Nerf guns somewhere. You know, it's just a, it's a thing. <laughs> it has to happen. <laughs> but Strike Commander, oh yes, that's what we were talking about. <laughs> now, so I read the review. Of, they had some. I uh, went to Moby Games and was looking at these games. And sometimes they put the quotations from a Computer Gaming World magazine in there. And this one said uh, the quote was it was so it was so ambitious the processors couldn't handle it. The pro we... So so ambitious the processors at the time. I guess it was 386s, and it was really yeah. more suitable for say a 486. We pushed a lot of hardware back in the day at Origin. I mean, we we made people upgrade their machines basically to play our games. It was it was kind of a badge of honor, I guess, for both the Ultima and Wing Commander teams. And it's like now if you put the little sticker on it that says "plays best on a Pentium," which I think that was on Wing Three, they're gonna go out and buy Pentiums. And you know, that's you needed to have the latest and greatest to run these games. None of them were, were, you know, little tiny games. So it was we I think we sold more video cards and sound cards and, and computer upgrades than anybody else did at the time. Um, were the hardware manufacturers did they I mean obviously they were happy about this, but were they actively sort of lobbying for more 
know, heavier uh -oh. requirements. They they certainly like you know the Pentium one. They they gave us the stickers. It's like please put these on your box, please please. I'm please. just gonna leave these stickers here, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just laying around. I mean, if you if you happen to see a box, you can stick them on and go for it. But yeah, I don't think they were necessarily a huge influencer, but they were certainly they were reaping the benefits of it. Hmm. So yeah, I mean we we had some very aggressive games, and some of the games I worked on I like to think would run really well today. Because they didn't necessarily <laughs> run when they came out. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. That Strike Commander certainly pushed most game, most machines to the limits. Pacific Strike was even worse. It. Uh, yeah, that game it, actually got number. It was number seventeen on their worst games of all time. Uh, oh game. no! Pacific yeah. Strike was. Yeah, this is the quote, right? Even on today's Pentium ninety, playing this game would be like flying World War One planes during World War Two. <laughs> <laughs> It it did have some. Is that rate. is that fair or is that just nasty? It is fair, unfortunately. That's that's the problem. Is it just it was too much? I mean, it was it was an awesome game as far as the concept. I, I love World War II. I think it's that that is the best period to set games in as far as flight games, because World War One planes are just so slow they're boring almost. World War Two planes are the cool ones. So yeah, we we pushed that engine really hard because we were still using the Strike Commander engine. Uh, but we just dumped a lot more stuff into it, and you know when you're trying to put ten warships out there, uh, it's gonna it's gonna slow things down a little bit because those were big big objects. So yeah, it was it, it's, it's fair. <laughs> I'm not happy about it, but it's fair. That's that's one of the ones I was specifically thinking about when I said I like to think it would run well today. <laughs> yeah. What was what? I'm just trying to imagine what what was it like around the office with us? Were people well? Let's just put it out there, and people will upgrade, or was there? I don't know about this. You know, maybe we should optimize it a little. I mean, what? there 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 were the twin pressures of, wow, this game's not going to run very well for a lot of people, and hey, you're on a on a schedule, and we we need to make some money. So you know, the financial guys weren't really concerned about frame rate. We were concerned about frame rate, but we ran out of time basically to do anything more with it. And, you know, it was, in hindsight, well, as the review shows, it, it, we could have made that game so much better if we could have optimized, you know, for another three months. But there, there comes a point when they're just like, just, just get it out. Mm -hmm. Put some units on the shelf. But that's, that's the game that we found the speech packs in the bargain bin at EB. And uh, we bought 10 of them for 20 cents total. And then we put them on Eric's desk. It's like, look, bargain. <laughs> I think the, I mean, the flying the planes is a pretty cool. I like the realism of the game. You know, that's one thing. But I was also kind of intrigued by this idea of uh, changing the course of the war. Yeah, like, the, kind of a, kind of an alternate crazy. history sort of vibe to it, right? Yeah, well, that's we definitely started with that a little in in the original game, and we were working on a, an expansion that never actually saw the light of day, which was unfortunate. But we were actually going to let you drop the the bomb on Japan, yeah. but you could change it if you did well enough so that you didn't even have to drop the bomb on Japan. So it was, uh, it, we were really doing alternate history in the expansion, but yes, we did, we let you change the course of the war a little bit. Because if you think about it, all of World War II was so much influenced by one mistake at Pearl Harbor that they didn't get the carriers. And the, the, the uh, commander of their battle group wanted to go out and hunt for the carriers. But the emperor said, "Nah, good enough. They're gonna they're they're gonna bow out now." Wrong. <laughs> it's like, no, we're a little mad right now, un unfortunately for you guys. And so, yeah, they didn't get the carriers, and that one thing changed the entire course of the war because it would have taken us forever to get our navy back up and running without the carriers. So, I mean, everything in World War II in the Pacific depended on carriers. So we we figured, knowing that kind of thing. What would happen if this battle turned a little differently? You know, what, how much would this affect it? And so, yeah, we had a lot of fun theory crafting. That's like a great, great seed of a new game idea there. There we go. A fun world to play around with. It might be. It, I mean, you can think of so many little things that can change the course of, especially a campaign like that, where every ship is crucial in some battle somewhere, and you know. All we were after was their carriers, and they were after our carriers. That was the goal, right? The winner, the winner is the one who gets all the carriers first. And so, yeah, that's that would be an excellent new game. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
That's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with part three of my interview with Mr. Rob Irving. A lot of great stuff coming up, so stay tuned for that. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, very sincerely, for supporting this show, Matt Chat. It really means a lot to me, guys. I really do appreciate that. Uh, if you want to keep these episodes coming, uh, pe- interviews with people like Rob Irving and the father of the settlers up next, uh, just head over to that link in the show notes to the Patreon site. And uh, if you do that, you'll get all kinds of extra content, as well as a shot at a signed box copy of Dragon Wars. And to make this even more exciting, it will also include uh, autographs by Becky Berger Heinemann and Janelle Jakeways and an original piece of art from Miss Jakeways. So this is absolutely stunning. Uh, but that will only go up to the people who are either new to Patreon or who up the up their donation by at least one dollar. And if it doesn't reach 500, then I get to keep <laughs> the, uh, the Dragon Wars box copy. Uh, So I'm almost tempted not to advertise it. Anyway, uh, what about that news from the Mat Cave? All right, quite a bit of news this week. We've got, uh, I guess, the most exciting thing here. A uh, good friend Adam Dayton from the Fac- uh, Fragments of Silicon podcast. He's interviewed Mr. Rand Miller of uh, uh, the Mist series, Cyan. Uh, I've been, you know, I'm a little jealous. I have to admit, I've been trying to get him on or his brother on forever. No response at all. Uh, just totally ignore everything I send him. Uh, but he's on Adam's show. Uh, <laughs> you know, make of it what you will. Maybe Adam's just better at that sort of thing. Uh, but anyway, no, uh, definitely go over there and check that out. It's a very detailed interview. Pretty much goes over his whole history. It's really, really good stuff. So congratulations to Adam uh, on that one. Uh, let's see, in other news, uh, Penn Gillette, you probably know him from that Penn & Teller, uh, either the uh, Magic Show in Las Vegas, or I think he also does a, a bullshit uh, show. It's a lot of fun. I think that's Showtime, right? I see, some, I see those on Amazon Instant sometimes. Anyway, uh, Penn has done a little, I guess he gave a talk, but it's uh, been written up about how uh, magic and games, uh, how they can shed some light on each other, I suppose. It's, it's pretty interesting read. He also talks in there about uh, video game violence and a few other topics. But anyway, I just thought it was a pretty good read. So I thought I would pass, the, pass it on. It's in Opposable Thumbs. I have a link to that in the show notes. And then a final bit of news here. Uh, there's a game called Super Russian uh, Roulette coming out for the NES, or at least it's uh, being kickstarted right now. They're trying to raise $20,000. Uses the an original NES and a light zapper. And I thought this was a joke at first. Somebody's a twisted humor at work, but apparently this is quite real. And who knows, uh, <laughs> some of you would actually want this thing. It's uh, being touted as a party game. Anyway, it's uh, up there on Kickstarter, so you can check it out if you would like. Now, what about that ale of the week? Well, I know Elizabeth has really outdone herself this time with some truly weird beverages. Uh, this is something called Candied Bacon Cream Soda uh, from the Cicero Beverage Company out of uh, Chicago, Illinois. Uh, so, Candied Bacon <laughs> Cream Soda, how can you pass that up? Got a nice picture here. There's a little strip of bacon there for the uh, river there. <laughs> You know, weird. Anyway, uh, let's get this uh, candied bacon cream soda open and see what it's all about. All right, so I've got some of this candied bacon cream soda. Here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling this and you know, I don't smell any bacon at all. I'm kind of wondering if they just made up that stuff about the bacon because I've got a pretty big nose. I'm not smelling any bacon here whatsoever. But anyway, uh, let's give it a taste. Maybe we'll taste what we cannot smell.
Boy, that really has to be tasted to be believed. I, uh, this is really, really weird. Okay, so you don't smell any bacon, just smells like a good cream soda. Now then you taste it, and there for a minute you just taste kind of a sweet cream soda-like taste. Uh, that you get from, say, an IBC uh, cream soda. And then suddenly you get this bacon flavor out of nowhere. It just kind of creeps up and slaps you on the face. It's really weird. Yeah, this is just too strange to be believed. Uh, I don't know what to make of this. It's kind of like you've, uh, you're have drinking some cream soda, but you had some bacon in your teeth. <laughs> some of that... A bacon flavor is still there. I guess if you really love bacon, uh, you might like this, but uh, I'm thinking this is only going to be fun for, say, a novelty, a little gag beverage. Uh, then again, I could, I could almost see this kind of growing up. It's got kind of a smoky bacon-like flavor there. <laughs> uh, folks, I don't know what to give this. Uh, I guess I'll go three out of five drinking horns on this. It, it tastes pretty good. The bacon is really weird. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to give this to some of your friends and, and not tell them about the bacon and uh, see if they can detect it and what they, what they think of it. Uh, but anyway, uh, candied bacon cream soda. I'll go three out of five drinking horns on that. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was looking up for quotations by programmers. I found one by one Donald Knuth. Wrote a book or two on the subject. It goes something like this. Science is what we understand well enough to explain to a computer. Art is everything else we do. See you guys next week. A rat cake, rat full bay, rat pudding, or strawberry tart. Strawberry tart? Well, it's got some rat in it. How much? Three. Rather a lot, really.